We'll look at the source of grace, the salvation by grace, the appearance of grace, the teaching of grace, the direction of grace, the divine person of grace, and then the effects of grace. It's all found within this portion of scripture we'll be looking at. So notice, firstly, the, the source of grace in verse 11 of our text. It says, for the grace of God. So Peter says that he is the God of all grace. And so the question's got to be asked, what is grace? Well, grace is the expression of God's goodness and loving kindness toward us, extended freely to the undeserved. Webster's Dictionary defines it as the free love and favour of God, the spring and source of all the benefits men receive from Him. An acrostic for the word grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. I thank God for that. All the New Testament epistles and letters recorded in the Bible that are divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit of God uh, most, if not all of them, begin and end with, with the grace of God. And in the beginning of our main text, we see in verse 11 that not only God is the source of grace, but salvation is by grace. Notice verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus and he said, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So we have redemption, that's, that's present, and then redemption, forgiveness of sins, it's through his blood, according to the riches of his grace, that undeserved, full and free favour of God, by his grace through faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8 in the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Someone once said, let deserved be written on the floor of hell, but on the door of heaven and life eternal, the free gift. And yeah, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That someone once said concerning the grace of God, that it's the battering ram that shakes the gates of hell. And I thank God that it's by his grace we can be saved out of the snare of the devil. And uh, the manifestation of grace, we notice here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, he says, God who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So salvation is by grace through faith in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 11, we now see as well the appearing of grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. To all men. Men here meaning every single human being, not just the male gender. All men in context of the chapter is aged men in verse 2, aged women in verse 3, young women, wives and children in verse 4 and 5, and young men in verse 6. And so God it doesn't leave anybody outside of the saving influence of his divine grace. I thank God for that. Even the unruly and vain talkers in the prior chapter. If Paul, the apostle, he charges Timothy, Titus, sorry, who he writes this letter to, to rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. So even these people have God's grace and pardon that's extended and available for them if, don't miss this, if they have repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 11 of our main passage, it completely undermines as well the false teaching out there today that before Jesus ever came and was died and crucified on the cross, Men were saved by their own good works, by keeping the commandments of the law. And this so-called dispensational teaching is wrongly, not rightly dividing the word of truth. And it's a lie from the pits of hell. Paul is simply saying here that the salvation that was brought to us by God's grace, it's appeared to all men. And all means all, not just people born 
on this side of the cross. But all sinners are able to respond to God by faith in any age and be saved and receive pardon for their sin. And I'd even submit to you that the fourth man alive, the fourth man from Adam, going right back to Genesis that ever lived on planet Earth, was saved by the grace of God through faith. Hebrews 11 verse 4, he says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. And we know that we're righteous by faith in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, by faith in, in God. That's how a man is declared righteous. And the very first mention of the word itself, grace, is seen in Genesis, in the very first book of the canon of Scripture. In the beginning, there was grace. In Genesis, there was grace. Noah, who built the ark, found grace through faith. Genesis 6, verse 8 in the Bible says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob found grace through faith. Lot, who chose to live in the midst of a wicked city, found grace through faith, and he was delivered before Sodom and Gomorrah was utterly destroyed by fire. Moses, who murdered an Egyptian, a murderer found grace through faith. Moses, uh, Rahab, a, a prostitute, found grace through faith. Even Paul himself found grace, who wrote this very text we're going to look into today. Uh, Christians at that time could have highly considered Paul to be like Hitler, to be like the Antichrist himself, when you think about it, the things that he did. Yet grace availed for him, and Paul was saved, and he became an apostle of God. And he wrote to the Corinthians, and notice this here, his testimony, he says in chapter 15, verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul knew he didn't even come close to even deserving the highest honour and privilege in the world that any man could ever have, which is to serve the living and true God. And after the sins he's done, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. And he even says in a different passage, he's the least of all the saints. But he goes on to say in verse 10 to the Corinthians, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And so grace availed for them in the Old Testament, grace availed for him, and grace availed for me. Amen. And grace can avail for you here today if you don't know the Lord, if you're not saved. And God is still in the business of transforming lives by his amazing grace. And we sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Amen. Was blind, but now I see. And so... Grace has appeared, and I thank God that it has, and it's appeared by the person of Jesus Christ. And we see he was, he was predicted by the prophets, he was born of the Vir Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit of God, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger, and at the end of his perfect life in earthly ministry, he was delivered up by the will of God into the hands of wicked men. He was mocked, he was beaten, he turned not his face away from shame and spitting that we deserve. They made a crown of thorns and put it upon his head, and he was led away to be whipped mercilessly. He gave his back to the smiters and his cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, and they led him away to be crucified. And his hands and his feet pierced longer than this nail right here that I, that I have, longer than this. To an old rugged cross. And he hung there upon Calvary and he suffered the, the judgment, the shame and the humiliation that we, we deserve. He was condemned in our place and willingly laid down his life to be our substitute. He died in our place, that being the down payment for our sins, that we could be forgiven and washed and cleansed and justified in the sight of the holy God, declared righteous. It was on the cross that he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he cried, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And Christ died for our sins, was buried, and then up from the grave he arose. 
amen, with a mighty triumph over his foes. We, we sing, he arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. I thank God for that. And if you're uh, lost yet in your sin and wandering, weary, come to Christ today and receive the grace and the pardon that he gives to the humble, the, the broken over their sin. The price was paid and, and we can be reconciled to God through the death of his son. The, the precious blood was that down payment. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And what a shameful thing it would be for anybody to reject their only hope. And I, I want to ask you and call you to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord is gracious. It's by his grace that we here today who believe have been and, and called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Listen to this here. We went from being the children of the devil to the children of God. We went from the power of Satan unto God. We went from darkness to light, from the bondage of the devil to the glorious liberty that God gives. We went from hell to heaven and we went from sin to the Saviour. And I thank God it's all by His grace that we have. And we sing, glory, I'm saved. My sins are all pardoned and my guilt is all gone. I thank God for that. The wonderful grace of Jesus. We sing greater than all my sin. I thank God for that. How can my tongue describe it? Where shall His praise begin? Taking away my burden, giving me liberty. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches even me today and it can reach you as well. We have the source of our salvation and we have the appearing of grace. But secondly, in our verse here, in verse 12, we see we have the teaching of grace. Notice it says, teaching us. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. And this word teaching here conveys the idea of training up to educate or to discipline. And I thank God that we're not only saved by his grace, but we can now become its students of grace. And so this no doubt applies to our practical Christian life. And there's two specific things that God's grace teaches us. And it teaches us to deny certain things. And the first thing we see in verse 12, teaching us that denying all ungodliness. Ungodliness, another word for this word is wickedness. When Joseph was tempted with the ungodly act of committing adultery, he said to Potiphar's wife in Genesis 39 verse 9, he said, Thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Ungodliness is having a lack of reverence toward God, a disregard to God, a neglecting worship that belongs only to God, and in the way we live and behave our lives, a lack of reverence, ungodliness. In Jude chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning or perverting the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what we have today, men distorting and perverting the grace of God into filth, like they can continue to live loosely and indulge in sensuality and without constraint or restraint whatsoever. Lustful people that are liars, they claim to be Christians. And that's what we have in this world today, full of false teachers. In Psalm 1 verse 5, God has said, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And so grace teaches us to deny all ungodliness and worldly lusts. And the Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 14, But every man is tempted when he's drawn away, drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. In chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world 
is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And Jesus said in John chapter 7, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. The world's system and its philosophies are ungodly and they're evil. Jesus, when he communed with God the Father, said in John 17, I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Again, here we're talking about worldly lust that the grace of God teaches us to shun or deny. John says in 1 John chapter 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth how long? Forever. All the lustful appetites of our flesh and sinful nature and the enticements that the world gives, it's all going to pass away one day. God said it will. But the life you live now and the labour you do now, by the grace of God and within the will of God, it will last forever, for all eternity. Grace teaches and disciplines us to separate from sin, if, if, if you miss that from, from what we've just looked at here. Grace teaches and disciplines us to separate from sin, not to continue in sin. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, the Apostle Paul says, But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, What shall we say then? In chapter 6, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, the Bible says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And in verse 12 of our main text, grace also teaches its students that we should live. Not only that we should deny these things, the negatives, but that we should live in this threefold manner given. Number one, that we should live soberly. The context of this chapter, again, is all men. He doesn't leave anybody out. Younger men, older men, younger ladies, older ladies, children. He doesn't leave anybody out of this. And to live soberly and to be sober is not to be silly, or, but to be sound and have a serious mind. Peter, in his first epistle, admonishes the saints of God and the church to be sober three times in, in the one letter. The, the verses for these, in chapter 1, verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace. See how he connects the two. Be sober, hope for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Grace teaches us to live soberly. First Peter verse, chapter 4, verse 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand, it's near. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. In chapter 5, verse 8, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a, as, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. We ought to be sober, because there's a devil out there that wants to damn souls to hell and deceive them. And so we as the saints of light ought to be sober. And grace teaches us to do that. Romans chapter 12, verse 3, Paul says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. A man of God once said, one who is disciplined by the grace of God becomes thoughtful, considerate, and he is no longer tossed about by passion or swayed with prejudice. Grace teaches us to live soberly and secondly, righteously. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And the Bible says that all unrighteousness is sin 
Therefore, we are to cut off any partnership with it in every form and fashion it comes. The Psalms have a lot to say about this, but I'll give you three Psalms here. Psalm 11, verse 7, The righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. God loves righteousness, and God's grace teaches us to live righteously in our passage. Psalm 4, verse 5, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Psalm 146, verse 8, The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind, the Lord raiseth them that are bowed down, the Lord loveth the righteous. And thirdly, we see to live godly, to be more like God. God is righteous. And, the, and to be more like the God of the Bible and less like the God of this world, which is the devil. Someone once said the free favour of God instills new principles, suggests new thoughts, and by inspiring us with gratitude, creates in us love to God and hatred of that which is opposed to God. Happy are they that attend the school of grace. Amen. This is what grace teaches. As soon as we come, he continues to say, under the conscious enjoyment of the free grace of God, we find it to be a holy rule, a fatherly government, a heavenly training. And that's exactly what it is. Grace disciplines us for the glory of God, for the grace itself, it comes from God. And this is how we should live. And God is trying to teach us this as his people. And uh, we have a gracious God, we can't forget that. Amen. The Bible says in Exodus 34 verse 5, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy and, for, for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and, and so on. Grace should govern our lifestyle for God's glory while we live. Paul says to the church at Corinth, he says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, there it is, by the grace of God we have had our conversation or our lifestyle in the world and more abundantly toward you, toward the saints. And how true is that? Grace teaches us to live and serve God in this threefold way of holiness, soberly, righteously and godly. The Hebrew writer, he says in chapter 12, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God Look at these, these two things, acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So God's grace upon our lives, no doubt, will result in this holy, living, acceptable service to God, producing reverence and, and a holy dread and fear of God as we serve Him. Grace from God, it teaches us to deny all ungodliness, and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world now. Not when the tribulation comes, and not when we're persecuted, and not when we're down and out, or not when we're, you know, we're doing well. But even when things are bad, in this present world, we ought to live this way. In verse 13, grace teaches us not only how to live, <laughs> I love this, but where to look. <laughs> Notice verse 13. What's that word there? Looking. Looking. <laughs> Looking for that blessed hope <laughs> and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So here we see the direction of grace. Grace points our gaze toward heaven, to Godward, to, to the second coming of Jesus Christ. In our passage here we see we're between the two comings. We're between the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of appearing of grace, and we've got the appearing of glory before us. You come in all his glory and with, 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 with the, the heavenly angels. Glory. Well, what a standing we have as the children of God. We've got grace 
the appearing of grace behind us and the appearing of glory before us. We're, we're, he himself is our blessed hope. And that's who we're looking toward. The direction of grace points us to the divine person of grace. And it, stirs, it should stir us up. It really should to live, you know, it just ignite a fire in our bones to, to live for the glory of God, not just on a Sunday, but Monday through Saturday. This, what we're hearing and learning, is not just confined in, in the house of God. It's even without, that's how we should live. And here, by the, the, by the grace of God, the deity of Christ is reaffirmed. <laughs> Look at this in, in verse 13. He says, And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So here's the divine person of grace. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Well, what's the mystery of godliness? That God was manifest in the flesh. <laughs> Deuteronomy 4, verse 39, he says, Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God, in heaven above and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. God, in the book of the prophet Isaiah, he said, There's no God else beside me, a just God and a saviour, there's none beside me. And we know that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And so this, here we see the divine person of God is Jesus Christ himself. In John chapter 1 verse 1, we see in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's full of grace. This is how grace appeared. And grace will lead us home. I thank God for this. God demonstrated His grace, His divine loving kindness that we don't deserve. Looking and studying this passage closely, I just had this conversation with the Lord. I said, I don't deserve it. But that's what grace is. It's undeserving. It's undeserving. It wouldn't be grace if we did deserve it. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7 says that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through who? Through, yes, through Christ Jesus. Verse 14 in our passage says who gave himself for us. I like what Spurgeon said on this thought. He said when the Lord Jesus came to Bethlehem and when he closed his perfect life by death upon Calvary, he manifested the grace of God more gloriously than has ever been done by creation or providence. This was not given us because of any deservings on our part. It is a manifestation of free, rich, undeserved grace. And that grace in its fullness. 1 Timothy 1 verse 14, he says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. What is it? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The Apostle Paul, he puts his hand up and testifies, I'm the chief of sinners. And, he, and this, no doubt, brings to our attention that we're, we're all candidates of God's grace. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And this very fact of history proves the exceeding abundant grace of God that he came. And he laid down his life freely, willingly, for our sin. Notice what the Hebrew writer says on this. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, notice what it says, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. The Lord Jesus gave his life by the grace of God. When Paul was writing to the church concerning giving, he, he used no greater example than, than the greatest. He says in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty 
might be rich. And we've got riches in heaven, mansions in glory, riches that will never pass away. He's gone to prepare a place for us. For God so loved the world that he gave. Here we see he, he gave, gave us his son and yielded his life and atonement for sin <laughs> and opened the life gate that all may come in. <laughs> and I thank God. Paul even said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul knew even in his ministry coming to an end that bonds and afflictions would arise because of him bearing witness of the truth of the gospel and living as a witness for Jesus' sake. And notice what he says in Acts 20 verse 24. He says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel, the, the power of God unto salvation is, the, is centered around the divine person of grace. He calls it here the gospel of the grace of God. And notice now the effects of grace. In verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Redeem here is to purchase back, to liberate or rescue from captivity or bondage, to regain possession of a thing alienated by repaying the value of it. And my brothers and sisters here today, Christ was our ransom and Christ is our redeemer. And I thank God that he's redeemed my soul. It's by the grace of God that I'm standing here today. This is partly the reason why I chose to uh, study the grace of God, because without it, I wouldn't be here today, behind, behind this pulpit. I like what Spurgeon said regarding this. He said, listen, listen carefully. Paul looks upon recovery from sin as being a wonderful proof of divine grace. He does not talk about a kind of grace that would leave men in sin and yet save them from its punishment. And this is the gospel we're hearing today, by the way. You know, you can be saved by grace, but the grace that saved you doesn't save you from your sin. You can still live in it. That's what we're hearing today, which is a lie of the devil. He says, no, his salvation is salvation from sin. He does not talk about a grace which winks at iniquity or makes nothing of transgression, but of a greater grace by far, which denounces the iniquity and condemns the transgression and then delivers the victim from it, from the habit which has brought him into bondage, which is the iniquity itself. He declares that the grace of God has shone upon the world in the work of Jesus, in order that the darkness of its sin and ignorance may disappear and the brightness of holiness, righteousness and peace may rule the day. God's sending us to see these blessed results in every part of the world. God makes us see them in our own lives, I'd say. And submit to us here that we can see grace and the work of grace in our lives. May we ourselves feel, he continues to say, the grace of God has appeared to us individually. The Apostle Paul would have taught us to know this grace was intended for all ranks of men. For the Cretans who were always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, even from the most despised bond slaves who were treated worse than dogs under the Roman Empire. To each of us, whether rich or poor, black, yellow or white, prominent or obscure, the gospel has come. It's designed that it may deliver us from all ungodliness and worldly lusts. I like what he says there. Verse 14, he says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And the Bible says, And purify unto himself a peculiar people. To purify is to make clean or to purge. And we sing grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Where one must make the Lord the Lord of his life and be in submission to the divine disciplines of grace by the Holy Spirit of God. In, in Peter's second epistle, he begins with verse 2 
saying, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. And he closes his letter off. How does he close? By saying, Growing grace and in the knowledge of our Saviour. When one grows in grace, they grow in spiritual, spirituality, spiritual life, in lasting joy, in liberation from sin, in gratitude, and being practically purged of all uncleanness that our former life uh, had uh, us in bondage to, there's no doubt. And maturing and conforming us into Christ, this is what the work of grace does in the life of a person that's yielded to it and given to it. Paul finishes off by showing us what it looks like in verse 14. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. And Paul even testified himself to the church. He said, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I laboured more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And so we are to live zealously unto good works because we're saved by the grace of God. And by grace we do it, how? With reverence, acceptably, and in godly fear. Denying these things and living in this threefold manner that we've looked at. So the question I want to give you today is, have, have you been saved by the grace of God? God's grace that you know, that, that was given to the humble, you know, us that have seen our sin and we've broken over it and have repented uh, with a low disposition of heart and turned from iniquity and seen our need, we received grace from God and, and more grace. The, the Bible, the Word of God from cover to cover, it begins with grace and it ends with grace. And so I'd like you to ask yourself, not only have you been saved by grace, have I been saved? Where's my heart this morning? Am I trying to get right with God with good works or am I depending on his grace alone? Not only this, but if you've come to Christ, praise God, I want to ask you, have you been a good student of God's grace in your life? And like Peter said, may we all be clothed with humility and earnest to see a need to grow in the grace of God in our life. And, uh, and who does God give grace to? In James chapter 4, verse 6, he clearly shows us who God, grace is given to. He says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And in closing this morning, I'd, I'd like us to have a look at the very last words of our of our Bible, the very last words that God recorded to us in Revelation chapter 22. The Bible literally finishes with grace. It says in verse 21, to, to close off the, the canon of Scripture, it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's pray.